The following podcast is a Sempronto Media production. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And I'm so excited to introduce to you David Wolf. And he has a website called Trigger Free Nutrition. He's written a book called The Fix for Cravings. And we are answering the question, am I addicted to sugar? He's amazing in helping so many people get free from being addicted to sugar. So David, welcome today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. So let's first talk about... How do you know if you are addicted to sugar or not? Yeah, so great question. So I, I, um, I have this like two question method I like to use, which it's not, I didn't come up with it, but it works really well. It's can you stop a, and then b, can you stay stopped? So a lot of people who identify with with dieting, um, diet mentality, they can stop. Um, but the question is what happens on day three, day five, day seven, day 30, can they stay stopped? Um, I think that's really clear. We have a lot of tools too that we can use. There was a tool that was used originally for alcohol. It was called the uncope. Um, and basically it, it's a six question questionnaire. And, um, if you, it basically, do you identify with not being able to say no? Do you identify with eating more than you meant to? Those are just a couple of the questions, but it's a six question questionnaire. And we've adapted it for myself and my mentor, Bitten Johnson. We've adapted it for food and sugar. And so I think that's a really good place to start. Um, that's one of those big screens we use because it's so quick. You can do it in like 20 or 30 seconds. Mm. So let's talk about you personally. Like what is a day in the life of what you eat in a day? Yeah. So, um, I usually, I didn't, I didn't always do this, but I don't really eat breakfast anymore. It just doesn't, it didn't serve me. Um, but, uh, I was in recovery a long time before I got to that point. I think that fasting is great. It's just not a really good treatment for addicts. So, um, uh, it works for me, but for a lot of people, it wouldn't work. So I, I usually don't do breakfast. So there might be a black coffee between, uh, somewhere between like eight and 11, but it doesn't happen every day. Um, I also don't do caffeine. That was one of the things I gave up. So, um, I certainly don't have coffee early. And then, um, my lunch meal is usually pretty protein dense. It's usually beef of some form. Um, there may be some vegetables there, but, um, not always. And honestly, dinner is pretty similar to lunch. Um, my family doesn't exactly eat the way I do. They certainly eat all the foods I eat, but they also eat some other ones that I don't. So I prepare a meal for my family. So they they may have a side that I wouldn't, um, consume. Um, so dinners, again, it's a uh, pretty protein rich and, uh, there might be like a Greek salad or something like that, um, with it. Um, Most of the fat that I consume comes from meat. Mm. I went on your site and I saw that you had this recipe called killer cough day. And my, my dad is from the middle East. He's around. Oh, cool. Uh huh. And so I make this kebab that is to die for. And it basically all it is, there's actually only two ingredients in it and it's just ground beef. And then you take an onion And you put it into the blender and literally make it the, so it's like mush, complete mush. And then you take all the water out of the onion so that it takes the water out. And then you just mix it with the ground beef and then make it into like little patties and put it on the grill. And I literally eat it almost every single day. But I like, I think I'm going to add, I looked at your recipe. I think I might add a little bit of parsley. I, I like that idea and some garlic to it. But when I tell you I eat it almost every single day, I eat it almost every day fresh off the grill. Yeah, I eat ground beef all the time. It's it's a really easy meat to work with. You can do so many things with it and it's really reasonable. So what if someone says to you, well, I want to talk about fruit for just a second because I think that fruit is just one of those things that is a very, you know, with all the health practitioners I work with, they're kind of all over the map on the spectrum of fruit. And so, you know, some people say, well, 
you know, I can start eating fruit and I can, and I know for me, I can get out of control with fruit. So I'll start eating some berries and it's like, oh my gosh, I can, can go on and on and on. And I'm not, I'm eating way more blueberries than I need to. So what is, how do you feel about fruit? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I try to meet the, the client I'm working with where they are. Um, but definitely like, um, I've heard fruit described as like God's candy, you know? So, um, I mean, it's naturally occurring in nature, but it's very high in a glycemic load. Right. So, um, a lot of people who are addicted to sugar are addicted to fruit. Some fruits are definitely safer than others. Um, in terms of like carbohydrate load, but still, um, like you were talking about berries, like berries are usually on the safer side, but still they have less sugar and they're tart. Um, but still the other thing you have to kind of, so we, we, I look at food addiction, like there's two things going on. There's, there's a substance, right? So if we eat certain substances, we're triggered much like the alcoholic would be triggered by the substance of alcohol or the cocaine addict would be triggered by cocaine, right? But you also have like the behavior, um, like the setup. So like berries and cherries, they're just like grapes. They're like these like little tiny little things and they kind of encourage snacking. It's like they just kind of pop and play, pop and play, pop and play. So that's like another thing. I know for me, like if I eat an apple, I'm going to want to eat two more. I mean, that's just, that's just my truth. So uh, if you're like struggling to, um, to quit snacking, I mean, fruit's definitely one of those things you want to look at and, and, and be try to try to be like rigorously honest with yourself about like, how is this working? Um, uh, I think, I think that when we can kind of step outside and look in, um, we can, we can get a better sense. If we can like remove our emotional attachment to the food, then we can see the truth about how it affects us. But if we're still like looking at it through that, like murky lens of like, no, but I still want that because it makes me feel good. Then um, we can't ever find a food plan that will work. Now, I know you've written a book, The Fix for Cravings, and I think it's so cool that you actually will sign it and personalize it when someone orders it. But give us three tips that you talk about. Give us a little tasting uh, for that book, The Fix for Cravings. Yeah, so I found that, I mean, a lot of food addicts come to me with problems with like sugar and flour. Um, but one of the things we really look at are grains. It seems like... Um, I kind of use an analogy, like let's say someone's addicted to Percocet. It, it doesn't matter if it's ground up and they snort it or if they take it by mouth, either way it will affect them. Right. So it's just a matter of speed to desired effect. Like how long will it take for you to get to the point where you want or what you're looking for? <laughs> right. So I look at grains and flour the same way. Like, yeah, flour will probably affect you faster, but it's the same substance. There's really no difference. It's just crushed up into little pieces. So that's one thing, like taking a hard look, um, at grains. The other thing is we know, like, um, people don't do well, uh, on their own. And so that's really built into the book. We have like a, a 10 to 12 week process that you would go through with others. They don't necessarily have to be going through the change process with food. Um, I mean, that's what the book is based on, but basically creating a group of people that can like support you and guide you. You can be accountable to, and, um, you can come in the next week and say, you know, that went really well. And you know what, that really didn't. So, um, that's another, another huge thing. And, um, I created this triangle, called the trigger free food triangle but the point is it helps us identify the foods that we're that we have a hard time with and it uses the points of guilt debate and romance so if you like have to debate whether about you should or shouldn't eat something you probably should eat it if you feel guilty after you eat it you probably should eat it and the romance is a little harder sometimes for people to grasp but it's kind of like that rendezvous like you're meeting your secret lover all alone you know, like you're hiding stuff in the trash or like you'll like eat in your car, but throw the garbage away, like in a public trash can. So it doesn't come into your house. Like those are the, the three elements and they help us identify what our trigger foods are. And so, um, because I believe in abstinence. So like my theory is if the food doesn't come in, the brain can start to heal itself. The body can start to heal itself. And it will stay healed until the food is reintroduced. So um, I think that's huge. And I think, I think abstinence is another huge tip and a lot of people really fight to moderate. And um, I, I don't know many addicts that can moderate. So um, that's another thing. Yeah. And I think that answers the question that you have to say, 
do I have to quit sugar for the rest of my life? And the, the answer is really, well, are you truly an addict or are you not? Right. And I think, I, I think it's a hard question to answer because like, um, we don't put a time restraint on it. So like for me, I do, I do for one day and I just commit in the morning to do my thing for 24 hours. And then it breaks it down into this like easy, like easily digestible block of time where like I could do anything for 24 hours, you know, right. like, um, they say like you could do anything until bedtime. Like you, it would might stink a little, but you could do it. But when, when you start to set up this like rest of my life, then people start to go into like this, like last supper concept with like, Oh, well, this is my last time eating Chinese and this is my last time eating pizza. And then, um, they eat it and then guess what they can't do tomorrow, not eat it. So, um, I think just like framing it in the day is good, but yeah, I mean, there are people that commit to not eating it for the rest of their lives, but they get to this point of bliss where they're like, they love what they're doing because of the results they're getting. And I don't even mean weight loss. I mean like clarity of mind, like, um, you have like normal emotional regulation where you're not like constantly like up and down, up and down. And then also like your dopamine, which is like, the neurotransmitter we associate with addiction, right? So it's not like rising and crashing and rising and crashing, which is like manifesting in the craving cycle. Um, so usually like when people eat something that, that they associate with cravings, there's a certain time, like a, like a space of time until like they need something else. Um, all that goes away because we're, our blood sugar is nice and stable, our dopamine is nice and stable. And, and then you have like clarity of mind and the brain fog goes away. So those are some of like the gifts we get from recovery. Uh, whereas that's the incentive to not use because that will all go away like that. Mm. What other tips in there can you share with us? Yeah. So um, I think, I think it's really a matter of finding the people that are like you, like you need to find that, that group that understands you, that understands mm-hmm. the problems you're facing on an everyday, whether that's like, um, Hand, being able to handle like creating, um, being around the foods that your family eats that you don't eat, or like you need someone that understands that and can support you. I think that's, um, that's huge. I think there are, there are some other practices that really help, you know, but I, a lot of them are associated around stress. I think stress is like a huge, a, it's like a huge motivator for us to, to eat, um, to appease it. We don't like being stressed. So we find that by eating certain foods, it, it kind of diminishes our stress. It just makes it worse in the end. But, but um, we're a society that's so into like um, fix now, like get the fix now. And so um, being around that community where people like actually understand addiction or actually understand your thinking and, and they understand what it's like to be in withdrawal and they understand how hard detox is and they understand that your, your mood swings are going to be wild and, and because they're going to get you because the identify that way. I think that's like the biggest thing you can do. Um, I mean, other than like controlling your environment, which is hard, right? If you have family members that aren't on board. Absolutely. Let's talk about some things that people quote, think are healthy. Um, maybe a f- smoothie and, you know, the smoothie they're making is an absolute sugar bomb. So kind of some of those myths that people are like, oh, I'm really doing this right. And meanwhile, without thinking about it, they're having, you know, 40 grams of sugar, 80 grams of sugar without blinking an eye. Right. So, um, I mean, well, basically a four ounce piece of fruit has between probably 10 and maybe 20 grams of carbohydrates, right? So um, that's equivalent to like a slice and a half of bread. So if you're using a cup of blueberries and, a, and you know, let's look, look, break down a smoothie, right? So let's say it's a cup of berries, like a cup and a half of yogurt and a half a cup of milk, right? Half a cup of milk is six grams of carbs already. That's equivalent to half a piece of bread. The yogurt is probably 12 grams. That's almost equivalent to a piece of bread. And then the fruit is equivalent to another one. So you already have like, the equivalent of four slices of bread. And if you look at a commercial loaf of bread, you're looking at like 16, like 16 to 20 pieces. So you just ate 25% of a loaf of bread. Um, likely not the intention you had when you set out to make a smoothie. So I think, I think like the smoothie is a great example. I think the other thing is this like, this like global fear of fat. Um, 
people associate fat with gaining body fat. Um, and there's like no proof that that exists. Um, it's been fantastic marketing um, by lots of big corporations. And um, I think we totally, we totally struck out on that one. So um, it seems that fat is a sustainable energy source, not um, a cause, a cause for body mass gain. It seems like it satiates us and it's helpful and it's not to be feared. There are certain fats I wouldn't eat, but, um, but the, the whole point is that people fear fat. Well, I think that yogurt, especially Greek yogurt, is often touted as a really healthy breakfast option or just a healthy snack in general. But a lot of them are low calorie, low fat. And I saw one of them, I think it was called La Yogurt's Rich and Creamy Low Fat. It had 33 grams of sugar in I one. Doubt it. Like yeah. This. And 33 grams of sugar, a, a standard Kit Kat bar has 21 grams of sugar. So of course, like if you said to someone, okay, as far as sugar goes, do you want this Kit Kat or do you want this yolk, this blueberry yogurt? Their first reaction would be the blueberry yogurt is healthier, but having one has 33 grams of sugar, the other one has 21 grams. So it's kind of like, oh. Yeah, and I've seen people in the grocery store like, um, I call them confused diabetics. They aren't necessarily diabetic, but they're like, you have a couple and you have a husband who's diabetic and the wife that's trying to help him. And they're like trying to sort through the cracker aisle, you know, and they're like, well, this one is this and this one is that. And it's just like, you so badly just want to like kind of pick them up gently and shake them and be like, you need to like undo all this thinking because it's so dangerous. Like what should a diabetic do? Most likely not be in the cracker aisle. So, um, but it's uh, it is hard because they've done such a good job confusing confusing us as to what we need, and um, and it's dangerous. And and they just dose down the serving size, so the serving size is like two ounces or like a fifth of a chocolate bar, or to make it like look appealing um, to the end user. In reality, they've just confused us, and they're just manipulating us. Well, my husband decided to, uh, this was probably about a year ago. He was like, I'm going to do, a, you know, I'm just going to have fruits and vegetables and juices. And he had gone to the store and came home and brought all these, they're called naked juice. Uh -huh, and he yeah. loves mango. And yeah, it was like yeah. this naked juice, mighty mango. Yeah. And I looked at the back. Yeah. It had 57 yeah, grams yeah. of sugar, 57. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in relation, like, you know, uh, Three Musketeers or Snickers has about 35 grams of sugar, you know? Right. Yeah, it's like 13 teaspoons, something like that. Yeah. Sugar, yeah. Um, anything else that you can think of that people are like, this is insane, the amount of sugar that's in this that people don't realize and their mind, they really think they're doing a healthy job. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to fruit. Beverages, um, what else do they confuse the heck out of people with? Um, I'm trying to think. It's like, it's kind of hard because I just like, they're not in my, uh, they're like so far outside of my paradigm. Um, I think you mentioned like the yogurt. I think that's a huge one. All these like dairy like concoctions. Um, I think that also really that, you know, I was looking at my husband loves, you know, like a tomato soup. And I was looking at this tomato soup and it was, he had gone to the store and got one and it was like, it was a healthy request soup at that, by the way. Sure. And the tomato soup, the can of soup had 20 grams of sugar in a thing of tomato soup. And he loves um, like marinara, but he loves this one marinara. I was looking at the back of it. It had over 20 grams of sugar. Right. Yeah. And sauce marinara is another sauce. One. Yeah. Sauce is a huge one. Or sauces in general, condiments. Um, condiments for sure. Barbecue sauce, ketchup, um, teriyaki. Those are huge. So let's say someone comes to you and says, listen, you know, I do want to cut back on my sugar, but I, I kind of, you know, obviously let's, let's talk about the different extremes. So let's, we're, I want to talk about the different levels. So, you know, level one, if they, if someone says, look, I'm on board, I want to cut 
all sugar out. Let's really get down it in, in our plan. And so we, I'm so excited because David has agreed to do a 30 day challenge with us. And so if you go to ChantelRayWay.com slash David kick sugar, he is going to be doing a 30 day, no sugar uh, Facebook group with us. He's going to be coming on weekly to do calls. We're going to have encouragement in there. And like you said, it's not that people don't know what to, sometimes people don't know what to do. That's true. true. Um, And you're going to learn that because you're going to learn some of these myths. But the number one thing, you know, in my business, I tell people, it's not that you need more knowledge. A lot of the times, the number one thing you need is the accountability. And that's what you're going to get in those 30 days. So let's talk about if someone wants to really take it to level one, the hardest level where they go, I want to have clarity. I want, what are they completely taking out of their diet for 30 days? Yeah. Uh, I would say sugar, um, ideally fruit, um, grains. Um, so if they're in level one category, are they having, if if they found, you know, a plain yogurt that had, you know, very limited sugar, would you say on level one that, that we're taking that out? Like a non-sweetened Greek yogurt that had uh, low sugar, would you say that would be in level one or not in level one? You're talking about yogurts that's like strictly made from milk? Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, I have, it depends on the patient. Like I have some patients that eat that, um, and do fine and Mm -hmm. they're addicted to grains and sugar, but there are other people that are addicted to dairy. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's really case by case. Um, but if they were going strictly like, and they were really struggling, it wouldn't be a bad idea to not eat that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the, with the fuller fat. Yeah. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Okay. And then let's talk about especially as a start. I mean, the fat's really helpful, especially in the beginning. So let's talk about in level one, what they can have. Like these are things that they're really going to load up on uh, as far as the type of vegetables they're having, which non-starchy vegetables are they not having? Sure. Talk about that. Yeah. So like the way I break down um, vegetables is if it's corn peas and it looks anything like a potato. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you're probably so like sweet potato cassava uh yuca batata like all that stuff um you shouldn't have that um the other thing is the things that grow underground are also higher in carbs so like your carrots and your parsnips I'm not saying you can't eat them but you you're gonna not want to eat just them like if you're having a salad with a couple carrots a couple pieces of carrots and like that's okay but I wouldn't like eat an eight ounce side of carrots. Um, And then the green stuff is great. Um, Some people, some people have a harder time for different reasons with certain vegetables, whether they're, they have arthritis and they're like nightshades or um, like tomatoes, eggplant, peppers. Some people don't do well with that, but greens are generally speaking your best option. There are also people that don't do well with, they have like autoimmune or they just don't do well with vegetables at all. So um, basically what we're looking at is low carb vegetables, especially the green ones, um, meats of pretty much all forms, um, lean or not lean, um, and, and oils, especially oils that are either coming from animal sources or, um, like, like lard or animal fats or, um, fruit oils like avocado, coconut. Yeah. My favorite vegetables are cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, spinach, avocado, kale, Brussels sprouts, um, and asparagus. Yeah. Those are all like, those are all right there. They're Mm -hmm. right in that section. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of people like playing around with cauliflower. And my favorite thing to make right now that is to die for that I had it at a friend's house and you take Swiss chard, which I've I would say I probably haven't eaten Swiss chard in a really long time. Right. And I took Swiss chard and chopped it up super, super fine. And then put all this garlic, like fresh garlic, but put like probably 20 cloves sauteed it in some avocado oil. And it was amazing. It was so, so good. 
It sounds it's good. Really, really powerful. Yeah. Okay. What it's a lot else? of garlic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like a lot of garlic in my stuff. Yeah. What else that you would say, like, let's say they want a snack. What would be a snack that they could have? That would yeah, be so, sugar. Yeah. So I'm not, usually, generally speaking, not a fan of snacks just because no, I think they, they really disrupt people's progress. Um, but I would try to make a snack like that has protein in it. Um, uh, like, like eggs are a really good snack. Um, I think some people have a harder time with cheese, but some people can handle it. Um, that might be a, an option there. Um, but, um, or meat, I mean, like a a meat based snack, whether it's a cured meat, that's not made with a bunch of sugar. Um, uh, I think that's, that's where I would go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love but the, it. yeah, the food plan doesn't really like orient itself around snacking. Like there's right. no, there's no hyper palatable food there. Right. So let's now I say talk- like, I say like a snack is an emotional event. Mm-hmm. It's not like a hunger event. Mm, it's I more like, like a boredom fulfilling thing as opposed to like a nourishment. Now let's talk about some of the benefits. And I would say, you know, brain fog for me Um, and skin issues. So I currently have a, you know, I'm really excited about doing this because I personally have been eating way too much sugar and my body does not respond well to sugar at all. I'm not, I just don't do well. I'll show you a picture here, but this is what it looks like underneath my boobs right here. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. That is straight yeast. Um, coming out of my gut basically, right? Like it's just yeast coming out because when I have, my body just doesn't, I'm one of those people, like if I could have, you know, too much fruit, I could have too much of this and it, my body cannot process the sugar. Well, I just um, don't do well with it. Um, so let's talk about some of the skin benefits, the clarity benefits so people can get, you know, cause right now they're thinking you can't have that. You can't have this. Right, right, right. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about how do you feel and why is this such a great thing to do? Yeah. We're talking about like no crashes, like people tend to crash. Um, and, and the reason behind that is the, the blood sugar and the insulin, the, you know, are, are just switching places. And so there's none of that because there's no reason for your blood sugar to climb. So your body has no reason to release insulin. Like at this point, my body is so sensitive that like, I feel my body release insulin, like my arms get crampy and I get irritable. Um, And, uh, and that's, I associate that with like eating things that the things that we're not talking about, you know, like fruits, uh, grains, um, things like that. So I think the other thing is, um, huge connection with the skin. Definitely. Um, the people that are focusing on meats and fats, primarily with some vegetable, they, they just have the best skin. I, it's just amazing. Um, we know that acne is like a manifestation of insulin resistance. So, Um, it makes sense that a lot of the skin issues are clearing up as the insulin level is going down. I mean, almost every chronic disease is associated with insulin. And so the things, so we know that, um, I think it's 90% of the insulin that our body releases is to handle carbohydrates. So we're talking about fruits, sugar, um, milk, um, grains. Um, and then we know 10% is used for protein. Um, and then 0% is used for fat. So the, the less carbohydrates we eat, the less we need insulin. No, insulin is associated with diabetes, um, high blood pressure, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. I mean, it's associated with all these metabolic illnesses. Like we're talking about, these are completely preventable, all of these things. And so um, that's, those are the benefits too. Um, I think energy is level and strong. I think mood is huge. A lot of people don't talk about mood, but like mood is so much better. There's no, it's just like, it seems like there are calmer seas. Just like life is just easier and more peaceful because we're responding to life instead of responding to the fact that, um, to what we're eating. 
Hey guys, one of the things that will take your weight loss to the next level is coaching. You can either work one-on-one with me or one of our certified private coaches. If you'd like, you can schedule your free call. It's a 10 minute strategy call just to see if coaching is gonna really take you to the next level. Don't just take my word for it. Listen to this recent review, a happy coaching client sent in. Thanks so much for your help and guidance. I never could have done it without you. The other thing is listening to the audiobook. Listening to the audiobook and getting the video course that I've done, people are seeing dramatic results. If you just listen to the audiobook 30 minutes a day, over and over and over again, and get the video course, go to ChantelRayway.com and check out the video course. You won't be sorry you did. So let's talk about um, kind of some of the alternate sugars. So obviously, I think everyone listening is hopefully on board because our audience is mature enough that they're not going to have things like sweet and low or equal. There's just so many things that people talk about how bad that is for you. But let's talk about some of the alternate sugars. And what is your opinion on those monk fruit, stevia, and how does that affect you? Yeah, so um, I can tell you how it affects me. Uh, It affects me because if I eat it, I want to eat more of it. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that, Um, regardless of the source. So um, it seems like so there, I kind of have this sort of mantra for people that are, that are less, um, all in about like treating addiction. So it's that if you, you need to remove, um, what you can't moderate and you need to replace what you can't remove. So, um, if I can't moderate ice cream, I need to remove it. But if I'm unwilling to do that, then I need to replace it with something. Mm, um, I love that. But it's not like, I want them to remove it. Right. Because I know how they're going to feel if it's gone, but some people just like aren't there. And some people are on like a trajectory. Like it seems like willingness to take action is, is um, it's a trajectory. So it changes over time. And you, that may be something you in the beginning you need. So it's just like, I mean, there are people who are addicted to heroin and they need methadone. I mean, Mm. who am I to tell you that you're not allowed to eat sweetener if that's what you need to get started in your recovery? I mean, if that's what you need, that's what you need. My, my mom's a food addict and she was, um, she was abstinent from like sugar and grains and all that stuff, but she was still using sweetener, um, for like a long time, I'd say probably like close to 10 years. And then, um, when she gave up sweetener, she went through another level of withdrawal. So that, that tells me. Um, there, there's something to these substances that um, is changing the way we think, the way we feel, even maybe on a biochemical level. Um, so I'm not necessarily like totally against these things. I think they're really helpful. Um, but when people are struggling, um, I think that removing them, if they're willing, um, often yields the best and the fastest results. All right. So let's talk about level two and level three. And again, that's ChantelRayWay.com slash David Kick Sugar. You guys have to join us next week for our 30 day sugar challenge. It's going to be amazing. So tell us what they're doing on level two and level three and what kind of more flexibility that they have on there. And so let's say, let's give some more ideas. So they say, okay, listen, I'm not going to go extreme. Like I'm not giving everything up. I want to be a little bit more balanced, but I do. We're talking about someone who maybe they're drinking sodas or they're drinking, um, they're eating a lot of processed sugar. They want to kind of move over a couple notches. What are some hacks that you have for them? Um, So, Correct me if I'm wrong. So there, I think we included a little bit of the low sugar fruits. So those would fall in the berries category. And was this, there's, I think, a, like a low carbohydrate alcoholic beverage. Yeah. Um, so, so level two is they can have half a cup of fruit and grains per day. Okay. And so that they're like not feeling deprived, but they're feeling like, okay, I can have some. And then one drink, because a lot of people were like, look, I'm not going to do it if I can't have a drink on Friday night or something. And then level three is to have one cup of low glycemic fruit 
and one cup of grains and two glasses of wine or, or soda per week. So you get to decide, do you want to be on level one, level two, or level three? Right, right, right. But what kind of grains do you feel like maybe don't raise the blood sugar quite as high or that if someone says, look, I have to have grains and I have to have fruit, what would your recommendations be? Yeah. So we know basically that most grains, regardless of the source, contain roughly the same amount of carbohydrates. So um, which is the excitatory aspect of it that like causes you to release dopamine and, and want to eat more things of that nature, right? So um, all grains have that in that. I mean, there are grains that have a slightly more protein. Um, so they're going to probably be a bit more filling. And those are probably the ones that um, you've kind of been hearing about as more healthy, like quinoa, um, buckwheat. Um, so like those are some of the healthier options, but it, it, they're still linked with all of the other metabolic consequences. So, um, so we offer, I would offer those there. Um, I would encourage, I mean, I would normally not say this to one of my clients, but I would encourage, um, you to eat grains that contain fiber as opposed to not, but, um, but that's just coming from a blood sugar perspective. But when you really watch people with, um, continuous glucose monitors, there's not much of a difference. Yeah. I am a huge fan of a continuous glucose monitor. I love, I'm, I wear one all the time now. I've had it, obviously, I don't have prediabetes or diabetes. I have a friend that's a doctor that writes me a prescription for it. My insurance doesn't pay for it, of course. I have to pay for it out of my pocket and it does cost me about $500 a month. Um, just to have it. And I absolutely love, love, love it. Have you, do you recommend people to get that? And what is your, I mean, I think it's a helpful tool um, it, for a lot of different things. I think um, uh, especially if you're, if you're one of these people that's like wants to learn the impact that certain foods might have on your overall health. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, you get a picture like that. I mean, you're like 10 minutes later, you're looking back what happened when you ate eight ounces of carrots. Like you can see. <laughs> boop, you know? And so it's really good feedback. Um, and so if it seems like the people that benefit from it are also the people that would benefit from something like a Fitbit or a pedometer, um, you know, something you can look back at and check. Like for me, I know what's going to happen if I eat certain things. So seeing it on a graph is, it's helpful to know the impact. Um, but, um, but I do, I think it's a good tool. I, I think it's a really helpful tool and it's unfortunate that the cost, um, yeah. because, um, I mean, we're talking about 88% of America's metabolically sick. So it's like more than eight out of 10, it's almost nine out of 10 people random. You take a random group of 10 people, nine of them are metabolically ill. So, um, yeah, the continuous glucose monitor, the CGM might really help those nine people. Awesome. Now tell us about, I know you're launching also a separate group um, that you have. Tell us all about that. Yeah. So we just started, uh, uh, we created something called Sugar X Global. So it's myself and four other uh, coaches that are trained by my mentor, Bitten Johnson. So one of the things that we really believe in is this tool called Sugar. So what Sugar is, it's, it's a comprehensive evaluation that takes food and puts it on the substance abuse paradigm. So it's like we're using the criteria for substance abuse addiction, but with the substance of food. And so what it does is it's, um, it's created in such a way where you have to answer each question with a corresponding age where the symptom first occurred in your life. So um, it could be something like, well, you're, now you're, um, when, when was the first time you, you ate more than you intended to? Um, and so you, it puts a little blip on the graph. And so what it create it ended up creating this line of the progression of your addiction over time. And then what that ends up corresponding with is your weight. Um, and then some people have other substances going on, whether it's nicotine or alcohol, or it could be hard substance as well, um, or behavior like gambling or um, codependency or, um, you know, uh, love or sex addiction or whatever it is. So it, it puts it all in one place so you can really see it. And what you end up really seeing is that people are changing seats on the Titanic. 
You know, they're really like, they're trading one behavior for the other. Like they, um, like they put the food down, then they start, they start, um, involving themselves in like a codependent relationship uh, or, or vice versa. Um, but so what we believe is we really believe in this tool and we really believe in abstinence. So what we've done is we've created a community and we call it the care model. It stands for community, um, action steps, recovery, protection, and education. So we're all about um, courses, um, materials. We're going to have daily groups um, at all sorts of different times for people in all sorts of different time zones. And it's just going to be a place for people to come together and um, and recover together. Like we were talking about accountability and community, like those things are paramount. You need to be around your people. And so this is going to be a place where people can have access to all those things um, at once. Hey guys, I wanted to tell you I'm offering a free weight loss virtual Bible study. Now is the perfect time to focus on understanding true hunger and fullness and learn what the Bible has to say about it. All you have to do is go to ChantelRayWay.com slash Bible study. After you sign up, you'll receive a six week Bible study video that you can watch on your own or you can get a small group of people and do it together. That's ChantelRayWay.com slash Bible study for your free six week Bible study course. I want to talk to you about um, caffeine and how it affects your blood sugar. So I've got my blood sugar monitor right here. I haven't eaten anything. Obviously, I fast every morning, Um, but right now it's at 93, which is a lot higher than it normally is. And I think it's because I had some green, I had a green tea and hibiscus. And for me personally, caffeine does raise my blood sugar, not outrageously, but before I had this tea, I was like about 82. And so then I had this tea and now I'm at 93. Can you talk a little bit about how caffeine, you know, cause obviously there's no sugar in this, this tea at all, but how it affects people's blood sugar at all and how it affected you and your decision to cut caffeine. Yeah. So, um, I believe caffeine affects our acetylcholine system in our brain. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's one of the four neurotransmitters you have dopamine, acetylcholine, um, serotonin, and GABA. So acetylcholine and dopamine kind of think about it as like your gas pedal and kind of think about um, GABA and serotonin as more of like a brake system. So I'm pretty sure it engages the acetylcholine system. Um, and so we know that we also know that there's there seems to be some congruency between um, in foods that elicit a dopamine response and a blood sugar response. So it seems like if it, the foods that most most people who would identify as being addicted to certain food substances um, would notice like in their CGM, they would notice they would be have that novelty feeling like that dopamine hit like, ooh, and then their CGM would correspondingly increase. So I think I think it it happens along those lines. I don't really know the biochemical relationship. Um, but I know it seems like I think it's like four or six out of 10 people. Um, caffeine raises their blood sugar. I know yeah. you just recently did a I saw I saw Ben Azidi put something up about it. Um, I think relatively recently, but, um, I know that the only way to tell is to check your blood sugar in correspondence with caffeine. Well, I think the other thing that it can do is that dehydration can cause your blood sugar to go up a little bit. And so if you're falling short on liquids, it can actually get your, your blood sugar to raise. So like for me, I think it's a part of it is just because caffeine can get you a little bit dehydrated. Yeah. It's a diuretic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So I think that's another piece that can add to the piece of maybe bringing the blood sugar at levels up. And like I said, for me, it, it seems like when I have a tea or something like that, that has caffeine in it, it will raise it about anywhere from five to eight points in there. Right. And, and could hypothetically break a fast for certain people. Um, so it's something to consider if, I mean, it depends why you're intermittent fasting, um, like whether you would want to consider that or not. And I'm certainly not a fasting expert, but um, it does seem like it could interfere with like the mTOR pathway and all that. 
all the, some of those really cool benefits and autophagy because autophagy could hypothetically stop if your blood sugar goes up 10 points. Um, the reason I gave up caffeine was because I went from one cup to two and I was going from two to three and, um, I identify as an addict. So, um, you know, I just like realized it was something that I was going to be using. And I, I also had a three month old at the time and, um, I knew I wasn't getting rest anyway. And that caffeine was affecting that. Um, I don't think I would identify myself as a caffeine addict, but, um, I always look for more different, better. That's like my personality. So I just saw it as, as, um, a potential threat. So I got rid of it. And, um, I think honestly, um, I've withdrawn from sugar and grains before. Um, and I've withdrawn from caffeine and I also with, I've, I was on ADHD medication for 25 years and I don't take that anymore. So I went through withdrawal with that. Um, but in terms of a short-term withdrawal, I think caffeine was the worst for me, mm, gotcha. but I also had an infant. So, you know, it kind of throws a wrench in there, but. Well, anything else that I haven't asked you that you want listeners to know about sugar and how addictive it is and just what they need to do to kind of get on that train of cutting that sugar out of their diet. Yeah. So I think the, 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 like the most important thing for people to do is to like do things like to take action. So it's, I say that, um, you can't, you can't think your way into right acting. You have to act your way into right thinking. So there's a saying like fake it till you make it. You know, I think like, I don't really like that one so much, but like act as if like act as if you're not going to have sugar today. Like, um, act as if like you're going to have a support system. Um, I think that's huge. So action is huge. The other thing that I think is, is really important is, um, there's this old story of, uh, I think it's of native American origin and there's, um, the boys, like the grandfather's talking to his son, his grandson, and he's talking about how there's two wolves inside each person. There's like a wolf of, of anger and resentment and fear and pride. And then there's the wolf of calm, peace and serenity and, and um, humility. And the grandson's like, well, grandpa, which wolf wins? And he says, the one you feed. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, and that goes back to the actions. Like what wolf are you feeding? Um, So in my mentor talks about red dog, blue dog, where the red dog is the bad wolf and the blue dog um, is the good wolf. But um, it's the same paradigm. It's just kind of like, look at the actions you're taking in your daily life and assess like, what am I feeding here? Like, am I feeding my strong good spirit or my strong bad spirit? Because everyone has tendencies and everyone has an ego and everyone has sense of self and everyone has desires and impulses. But who are you feeding with those impulses? So if my impulse is to like it was for most of my life to go downstairs, open my pantry and eat three cookies, um, like first thing in the morning, like I'm feeding, I'm feeding my red dog. I'm not, I'm not feeding my blue dog. So how do we take actions to feed the blue dog? And the other thing I would tell people is that um, no one is beyond hope. No one is beyond help. A lot of people might feel helpless and hopeless, but that's not true. Um, I think if I've seen helpless cases um, like transform. Um, I was just talking to a woman yesterday who's lost 200 pounds. Um, she was um, she was almost 400 pounds for most of her adult life. I mean, that's amazing. Um, and, and also that like slow and steady progress is okay. Um, some people lose weight really quick. Some people feel better really quick. Some people don't. There are food editors who don't have any weight to lose. Um, like I was one of them. I was like a, I was like a, I was relatively thin, but, um, I couldn't stop eating. So it's just one of the symptoms. Um, and the other thing is find a community, find some people that are like you, find some people that you identify with and you can, um, you know, be really honest with. Um, and not feel bad about that. And that's one of the reasons um, we run groups and I run a free group every week because people need that connection. Even if it's only once a week that you can, for one hour, you can feel like you belong somewhere. Mm. That's huge. That's awesome. Well, we really encourage you guys to go to ChantelRayway.com slash David Kick Sugar and get into that 30 days 
get involved. You know, it's $30 for 30 days. That's $1 per day that you're investing in your health. That is insanity if you don't do it because it's this is definitely going to take you in. Again, we have different levels. So you don't have to go all the way to the extreme. We just want to make you to have progress and to take it to the to the next level. So David, tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Yeah, sure. So um, you can definitely follow me on Twitter. It's uh, trigger free, trigger free underscore RD. Um, I'm really active there. Um, I also moderate a Facebook group called Sugar Bomb in Your Brain. That's for uh, people who identify with food addiction, sugar addiction, sugar bomb is one word. So sugar bomb, one word in your brain. And then um, the other thing is that if you want to sign up or get on the wait list for our new community, which is going to launch really soon, it's sugarxglobal.com and throw in your name and your email and um, you'll be the first to know um, what's coming next. So, and then my website is triggerfreenutrition.com and I work with people one-on-one and I also run groups there. Mm. And like we said, it's now time to crush that sugar habit once and for all. So we hope that you join us, chantelrayway.com slash David Kicks Sugar. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye for now. This has been a Sopranto Media Production.